welcome to Co-Produce Care. Today we've got with us Jeremy Hughes, who's the Chief Executive of the Alzheimer's Society. So welcome, Jeremy. Hi, good to be here. Hello, thank you for um, coming on to Co-Produce Care Chat with us. Uh, so first things first, can you introduce yourself and your role in uh, the Alzheimer's Society and also say a little bit about how you came to work in this area of social care? Okay, so um, I'm the chief exec of Alzheimer's Society, so we're the leading care research and societal change charity working on dementia in the UK, uh, bringing together people in all different fields to make a difference for people living with dementia. And I joined 10 years ago. I came from being chief exec of Breakthrough Breast Cancer and wanted to move into a role where I was leading an organisation that could really make the biggest difference ever on an issue that was being neglected by society. And I had personal experience from my dad having dementia as well. So that sort of led me into wanting to be in this space. Mm -hmm. But I could see that you know, people weren't talking about Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia as much as they should. Something needed to change, something needed to be different. And Alzheimer's Society, I think, was waiting to lead the nation in that step change, which is what we've been doing over the past 10 years. Great. Um, and in terms of you know, your succession, you're moving on, so you're the outgoing CEO. Yeah. Um, and the new uh, CEO, I think, is Kate Lee. Is that right? That's right, yes. What three things would you advise her to do in her new role taking over from you? Uh, I think the three things that immediately are apparent to me, one is make sure that we continue to invest both in research and in care. So we, we need to do better in the care and support we provide to people with dementia, but we also need to be driving the research agenda. And that's not just about biomedical research, it's also research into what is good care. Because often we assume we know what good care is, but the evidence base isn't always as strong as it needs to be. So first thing is continue to invest in research and care. Second thing is to make sure that we continue to inspire the army of volunteers we have across the country. So we've got around 7,000 volunteers supporting us in providing local services that support people with dementia. But we've also got around another 10,000 volunteers who are Dementia Friends champions, who run the Dementia Friends programs up and down the country. And we've got thousands of volunteers involved in campaigning and awareness raising. So continue to nurture and support people who, who are voluntary, voluntarily giving their time. And then the third thing is make sure we raise the money that we need to raise. So it's all very good having the good intentions. It's all very good saying we want to change the world. But unless you've raised the money, you can't actually do anything. So continue to invest in fundraising. We've done really well. In the last couple of years, our budgets continue to increase where other charities, their budget has stand, stood still or even fallen. And we have continuing to grow. We're continuing to get more people giving us more money. But we, we need to keep the pressure on. We need, you know, the job is not yet done. We need to continue to raise more money to be more effective. So those would be my three things. Brilliant. And um, in terms of the Alzheimer's Society and how it came about, there's a lovely story that I came across about uh, Morella Cayman. Yes. Um, and the, the letter that she wrote and the impact that she made. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. So this is the far 40th anniversary we've just celebrated. So we were founded in 1979. And the interesting thing was there were three people actually who were involved right at the beginning. Morella Cayman was one and two other people, Cora Phillips and Gordon Wilcock. And they all joined together to set up the society in the first place. And Morella was a driving force and was still involved today. So even in her 80s now, she's still very actively involved in supporting us. And she wrote a letter to the Observer newspaper basically saying, my partner, my husband's got dementia there isn't any support, we need to do something about this. And she got inundated with people writing in saying, yes, I've got the similar experience. Yes, something needs to happen. Something needs to be different. Let's make it happen. And so it was really exciting to see from that upswell of public opinion, she started round her kitchen table with a handful of people, something that's grown into being the Alzheimer's Society today. Great. And in terms of I mean, that's a great story about how someone's personal life can then start a whole movement and, and then you end up with the Alzheimer's Society. Do you feel that there's a type of stigma in the past, or maybe there still is a stigma around dementia and how people are dealing with it that really needs to be dealt with to tackle the issue? Yeah, I think there still is. There's still a lot of stigma and discrimination 
that means people don't want to talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. They still feel somehow it's not the right thing to be involved in. We've changed that a lot. And the Dementia Friends program has been really instrumental. You know, we've now got almost 3 million or over 3 million people now have become dementia friends. And that's about just saying it's okay to talk about dementia. It's okay to have that conversation. And it's make, basically normalizing it and making it a, an accepted, you know, it's a disease like any other disease. There's no reason why we shouldn't talk about it. But people often caught, get caught up in a lot of guilt or shame or fear. And you need to overcome those. And we've worked really hard across the country and with different communities to make sure that we break through some of those taboos. So a great example is we did a program with the East London Mosque where they have about thousands of people, I think several thousand people coming to prayers every Friday. And one Friday a few years ago, all the imams in the, in the, in the worship at the mosque on the Friday talked about dementia. They all talked about dementia. And from that, we set up a support group within the Muslim community in East London so that we trained up people from within the community to start talking about dementia. And I went back there last year, sort of several years after the programme started, and I met a man there who's got dementia, and I said, what difference has this made? And he said, well, before your programme started, I was afraid to come to the mosque, and to me, coming to prayers every Friday is really important, but I didn't feel I could come because I didn't feel safe. And now I feel it's okay. Now I feel I can safely come. Nobody will give me odd looks. Nobody will make me feel discriminated or isolated. I can be part of my community. And I think it's that transition to making dementia just something that people aren't afraid to talk about, just saying it's part of everyday life and you shouldn't feel ashamed or frightened. Uh, you shouldn't fear how people will react. We all need to be supportive. And I think that's the big change that's happening. And is that idea of community really important um, when you think about dementia? targeting or, or really being a, uh, some, an issue for a certain part of the community. I think women really suffer from dementia more than yeah. men. Um, yeah. And then on the other side of it, there was this uh, really sort of heart-wrenching story that was um, on BBC News about uh, Anne and John, a couple. Yes. Where she ended, Anne was a, a carer for John, and the way that she had to effectively like go through a mourning of, of losing her husband. Yeah. But the, yeah. He wasn't there in mind but he was there in body so it's, yeah. it's quite a bit of a trauma and just having that conversation and also yes. about the, the help that you have in the community both of those are just can be so empowering for, for families yeah and you're absolutely right i think what we have to recognize and i think we're increasingly recognizing in outside society and in the wider care community is that we need to think about the need of support for the family caregiver as well as for the person with dementia and all too often the person with dementia ends up being isolated and get, often going into a care home maybe before they need to because their family care has collapsed, because they're isolated on their own and they're not getting the support they need. So enabling people to feel that they're not on their own, that they can talk about it, that there are the services such as those provided by Alzheimer's Society that enable you to get professional advice and things like our, our side by side service where we find a volunteer who links up with a person with dementia and they do things together. They go to football matches together or they might do jigsaw puzzles together or whatever they want to do. We find a volunteer who will do that with the person with dementia. And that frees up the time of their family caregiver who can get some break and can go off and get their hair done or do their shopping or do something that they, they want to do without the 24 seven support for their loved one, which is what all too often they feel they, they can't escape from. So I think it is about encouraging that whole community support and finding willing people who will help change that conversation. We did a, we, we used to, in Alzheimer's Society, we used to, and we still do run some things like dementia cafes, where you set up a place where people with dementia can come and they can be supported and they can you know, come once a week and meet other people in a safe environment. And I went to one church actually in, in Leeds, which was a Pentecostal church. And there were two women with dementia there who historically, we might've said, oh, don't go to the church lunch club, come to the Alzheimer's Society Cafe instead. And what we've done now, which is a great example of how things have changed, is we've now supported that church community to allow the two women with dementia to carry on going to the church lunch club in the way they always have done. And to, and to educate the other people at the lunch club to feel it's okay to have these people here. And we have a responsibility to support them. So rather than segregate people off and send them to a different place, you're saying, how do you change the place they already go to? 
the place they already relate to and let them carry on in that environment. And that's been really, you know, there are lots of examples like that. We've worked with, you know, so many organizations, with companies, with faith groups, with community organizations, with sports centers, a whole number of people who are now saying, we can change the way we operate to enable people with dementia to be part of the community. All right. Um, I mean, there's obviously you have a lot of support from volunteers, um, but in your sort of 10 years of being there, you've managed to increase revenues by twice, I think. Yes, to, yeah. Um, and obviously still a lot of the initiatives that you're doing, you do need resources. How are you able to um, get those extra resources and how can people support you? I think it's very simple. I think what we do is we make sure we go and ask people. And as we ask people and we demonstrate that they can give us a donation, that that will make a difference, that there's some tangible result, both in the short term, in terms of providing funding for our helpline, for example, for our dementia advice service at the local level, but also long term, how people can give us some money that allows us to invest in research for the future. And if you show people what a difference a small donation can make, everyone who gives us five pounds a month is giving us the ability to employ more dementia advisors, the ability to have more volunteers. And when people see that and they see that they can break down some of the problems people have had by their generosity, people will carry on giving. And so that encouragement, that opportunity to feel that you're contributing. We had a great example last year when we were the official charity of the London Marathon. And we, had, we raised more money than any charity as the official charity has ever done before. So we even raised more money than Cancer Research did when they were the official charity. Wow. And that's because so many people, when given the opportunity, when, said, when they heard that they could run for Alzheimer's Society and the Dementia Revolution team that we, we were running, they, they became part of it. They wanted to join, and people do. You know, most people nowadays have some family connection to Alzheimer's. They, they have somebody in their family or in their community, in their voluntary organization, who's affected by dementia. And people, given that opportunity, say, yes, what can I do? And the simplest thing people can do is make a donation, which allows us to do the work we do. So that's how we've, we've doubled the income. Um, I've heard you talk before about three strands of uh, areas of work that the Alzheimer's Society yeah. um, focuses on. Could you just remind us of those three strands and then talk a little bit to the research side and, and whether that's yeah along fast enough for change okay well let me end up with the research one and i'll tell, tell you a bit more about that so the three strands the first is the care and support we provide every day of the week to people with dementia in the community so that's our operational services where we have local groups local volunteers providing hands-on support to anyone who's affected by dementia plus a national helpline uh, information sheet so wherever you live there's support from Alzheimer's society here and now to support you in the daily struggle you have coping with dementia. So that's the first part of it. Second part is driving societal change. So things like the Dementia Friends Programme, Dementia Friendly Communities, where we're saying, we will give you the tools, whether you're an individual becoming a dementia friend, whether you're a, a, a business or a voluntary group or a government agency, we'll help you to become more dementia friendly so that you can be more supportive to people in their everyday living. And the third strand is around research, where we've been now investing more than 10 million pounds a year in research, and we've set up a Dementia Research Institute that we've committed to give 50 million pounds to, and got government funding to support as well. Now research, there are two sides to it really. One is the biomedical research. So finding out, uh, developing a new drug or a new treatment that might stop the development of Alzheimer's. Now, charities like us on our own can't do that, but we can do some of the early research that then the pharmaceutical industry piggyback on and develop the drugs. And there's a new one that Biogen have just developed called Aducanumab, which they did results just before Christmas that looks for the first time as though there's promise of a, dr a drug treatment that's effective for Alzheimer's. So we've had nothing for 15 years. And this is the first time. It's not there yet. It's going to take more research to get there. But it looks very, very promising at the moment that we will get a drug that actually works. But the other side, as I mentioned earlier, is that we need to research into what is good care and support. So we have, for example, we have an innovation program where we give small grants to organizations who are developing new products that help people better support people living with dementia. So we did thing called um, jelly drops, which are sort of hydration sweets. So they're like, they're, they're, they're highly concentrated hydration because a lot of people in care homes with dementia don't drink enough. 
or in their own homes. And these are specially designed sweets that are nice to eat, but give the, that they give you high, high volume hydration. So they help you keep hydrated. Yeah. Uh, and we did some research with care homes involved to test it out and prove that it works. And that's just gone into commercial production. So from our small beginnings, where we gave a few thousand pounds to kickstart it, it's now becoming a commercial product that will make a big difference. So that kind of research into better care and support. We did another one, uh, which was around reducing the use of antipsychotic drugs, where we found what are the conversations you can have with somebody, where you find out what's causing the challenging behavior. Why does somebody you know, get disruptive? Why do they get abusive? And normally it's because something's making, making them upset. And if you can train people, which we did working with King's College London, we developed a training module to enable people to have the conversations with somebody with dementia that understands what it is that's causing the upset, then you can stop it happening. And that's much better than just dosing people up with drugs, mm -hmm. which might be a way of controlling behavior, but it's not good for anyone. Yeah, I mean, there's so, a... so, yeah, so, so that research is a really important part of what we do. Yeah, absolutely. And those are really two very interesting developments. Um, and you know, obviously you're doing a hell of a lot there, but there are certain things that are outside of your remit um, in the Alzheimer's Society. And I wanted to move on to politics um, yeah. and thinking about, you know, social care has generally become quite politicized uh, lately, especially in the last couple of years in the, in the recent general election. Are there any maybe top two or top three things that you would want this newly appointed government to concentrate on in the area of social, social care and maybe particularly focusing on um, dementia? Yeah, well, absolutely. There, there needs to be a step change in the way in which people are supported through social care. So the interesting thing is that most of the public think that social care is paid for by the state. So the public have no awareness. They assume that because the NHS is free, somehow when they need support in, from domiciliary care or in a care home, it'll be paid for. As we, as we know, that's not the case. But people don't realise that until it happens to them. I think what's happened in the last couple of years is more people are now aware of that as a reality. And we know from our research that people typically spend £100,000 of their own money supporting a loved one with dementia. And often it could be five times that amount. So a lot of money is being paid for by individuals because there isn't the state funding. Now, where we got to before the election was a commitment from Boris Johnson since he came in as Prime Minister that he would fix dementia care, that he would stop people having to sell their houses to pay for their care. Now, it all went a bit quiet during the election. Uh, we now need to hold his feet to the flames and say very clearly, you have an opportunity now to do what no government has done, which is to put social care funding on a firm footing. We need to be saying that the government need to be putting money in. It's not, you know, people say it's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. And we did research that showed that there's a lot of money being spent by the NHS picking up the pieces because there's a lack of social care funding. So typically people will end up going to A&E and end up in hospital because they didn't get the support in their own homes. And we did a survey on 2017 data that said there were 72,000 avoidable admissions to hospital costing 400 million pounds. So had there been good social care funded by the state, costing a fraction of that, those people wouldn't have ended up in hospital. So we're saying, with the majority you've now got, Mr Johnson, you can afford to do something about social care. Doesn't matter the public don't realise it's, it's, it's not being paid for. Now's the time to grasp the nettle and put proper social care funding on the agenda and make sure that people get the support they deserve. Now that may take many years to put in place. So in the meantime, we're saying there needs to be some emergency funding to support people with the additional costs of dementia care. So we know that dementia care in a care home, for example, may cost up to 30% more than standard care because the demands and needs of support are greater. So we're saying whilst you do the long-term fixing, of of fixing of social care, we need you to provide some immediate funding that supports people with the immediate extra costs of dementia care. And we're going to be shouting loud and clear to the government as much as we can in the next few months to make sure that they get on with it and they don't forget about it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you have any ideas for what might be a solution for, for long term funding? I know at one point the dementia tax was touted, but that was uh, quite um, um, popular. And why do you think yeah. the dementia tax was so problematic? 
I think people, I mean, my personal view, and this isn't a sort of outside of society position, but my personal view is that general taxation should pay, pick up the, the bill. So we don't, have, we don't have a dedicated tax for the NHS. We don't have a dedicated tax for defence or for schools. So why aren't we saying that in the same way that schools get a budget from the government, that social care should as well? And it may be, you know, if it's 10 billion pounds in the total, the, the NHS is 130 billion pounds a year. You know, if, if, if social care was 10% of that, you could actually fund it properly. And that's not an enormous amount to ask for. We, we are, what, something like the fifth or sixth richest country in the world. To think that there are hundreds of thousands of people with dementia and other older people and people with disabilities who don't get the support they need is actually outrageous. You know, we could easily afford it. So I think at the end of the day, the Treasury need to be persuaded that it's worth spending some national taxation income on rather than having a dedicated one-off tax just for dementia care or social care. We don't do it for schools. We don't do it for defence. Why should we do it for social care? It should be a core bit of funding for government to pick up the responsibility for. Now, longer term, part of the long-term social care reform means that you could have a, six, a system where there's a base level of support that's paid for by the government, and then you could have top-up funding that people can have from a private insurance policy to pay for additional support on top. So, but that will take you know, 20 years to put into place because people would need to run insurance policies for a number of years before there was enough money to call on them. But that could be set up. You could have, so I think there's an immediate government commitment to funding. And then long term, I'd be very happy to look at the mixed economy of some core government funding with the potential additional funds that people contribute themselves to top up the, the core funding. Um, you talk a lot about, well, last time I heard you talk, uh, dementia rights. And actually the mm -hmm. society has got, uh, I think, is, it, is it five or ten points? Yes. Five um, points, yeah. Five points, there we go. I was being a bit overambitious. Five points, <laughs> simple, um, on dimension rights. And I was quite interested to know that you'd looked at international human rights for inspiration, um, yes, yes. as well as doing it co-productively with people who um, yeah. either work with dementia or work with people with dementia. And I was interested to you know, know why you were inspired by, I think it was the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Um, and then separately, how you managed to get so many people involved in, in creating those uh, rights. Yeah. Well, the starting point, as you say, was that the, we know from international law and from the World Health Organization that dementia is included within the UN Convention for Rights of People with Disabilities. So it is covered by that international legislation anyway. So when we looked at it, we said, why is it that nobody's taking this on board? If the UN Convention relates to people with physical disabilities, it also ought to relate to people with dementia. So our starting point was there's a position in international law that says people with dementia have rights that need to be respected. And then from that starting point, we did an enormous exercise and it took a long time. And this was one of the key learnings. So if you're trying to engage people with lived experience of dementia, you can't do it in a few weeks. Yeah. You've got to spend a lot of time building relationships, letting people have conversations, recording those conversations, going back and talking to people a bit more. So we literally involved hundreds of people across the country in focus group discussions, in, in questionnaires, in surveys, to trawl opinion, to find out what it was that people wanted in terms of those rights. And the rights, the five statements, the rights statements that have been written were written by people with dementia and their family carers. And, um, and we set up, well, they set up a group called the Three Nations Dementia Working Group, which covers England, Wales and Northern Ireland, because Scotland already had a group. So now the whole of the UK is covered by an organisation or organisations that represent the voices of people with dementia directly to make sure that this isn't a one-off exercise. It means we can carry on having those conversations as we go forward and keep people involved all the time, because having a set of five statements doesn't change anything. It just means you've got a document which prints them out. What you need to do is make sure that people live them and breathe them and take action to make it possible. And we need to be monitoring how far and how effective those implementation of those rights have been. Yeah, I think that's really important and it's powerful. Um, and the UNCRPD has been so co-produced co itself. It's quite, I think it's quite uh, inspirational that you yeah. took that as a starting point and then worked back and then still continued to in involve people with lived experience. Um, so you're coming to the last few days or weeks, 
you know, when, well, when a few months, yeah, a few yeah. months, okay. so up to Easter, up to Easter, okay. Really. okay. Um, is there any one thing that you would take away? Uh, I think about I'm being really proud of implementing um, at the Alzheimer's uh, Society. I mean, it's been 10 years, so it's yeah, a yeah, period of time to think about one single thing, uh, but maybe there is something looking back in reflection Ooh. that. Uh, you feel this is something that I'm going to sort of take away, maybe write a book about, I don't know. uh, (laughs) Um, Is there anything? I suppose the one thing that stands out for me that we've referred to already is the Dementia Friends Programme. So this, you know, when we started it in in 2014, it was the idea that we would get a million people to become dementia friends. And we took the idea from Japan, who already had something very similar, where you have 40-minute awareness sessions run by volunteers, to get people talking about dementia. It's not rocket science, it's not very complicated. It just breaks the ice. It makes it stop, it stops it being a taboo subject um, and makes it possible to have conversations. Now we set out with an ambition that by this year, by 2020, we would have a million dementia friends. We've already got over 3 million. We've got thousands of people, you know, every week thousands more people are becoming dementia friends. And we've now got programs in over 40 countries around the world. So it's been copied around the world. So I'm really proud that we've set in train a movement, a global movement, which is changing the whole nature of the conversation around dementia. So, you know, it's a bit like the gay rights movement uh, in the 1970s and 80s. We're actually changing the way people relate to an issue. We're making it possible to talk about. We're getting it out in the open. We're making people proud of the fact that they, they can talk about dementia. And I think that's probably the biggest lasting change that we've made is, is changing the dialogue, changing the conversation. Fantastic. And presumably all of that information or how people can get involved is all on the website. So Yeah, yeah. There's a Dementia Friends website. You just uh, type in Dementia Friends and you get up and you can actually become a Dementia Friend online. But the best way is by coming to one of the local groups. There are hundreds of local meetings happening all the time and anyone can become a Dementia Friend. And then the idea is you learn a bit and then everyone commits to take an action. And sometimes those actions can be very small. They could just be realising you've got somebody in your street who's got dementia and saying once a week I'll go and check in and make sure they're all right. Other people take much more action. Some become Alzheimer's Society volunteers. Some become fundraisers. People can do whatever they feel they want to do to make, and some can be workplace based. So you actually think about people in your workplace who might have early onset dementia. How do you make it possible for them to carry on working for as long as possible? So it's something for everyone. Yeah, that's a um, fantastic achievement. And um, like I said, I'm sure more people are now going to log on and, and see what they can do in their community. Hope so. And now, starting this month, because we start, start the new year, we always want to start something new. We're doing a monthly sort of phone-in or, or web chat where people can ask any questions of the senior leadership team. So rather than, it's just an open, open door for people to get in touch and say, this is what we think needs to change. This is what we think. And I do... I do a monthly society briefing where I talk to everybody in the organisation live on, the, on camera uh, just to give people the, the feeling that they're connected and that their voice matters and that we want to hear from them. Because like most voluntary organisations, most charities, what we depend on is people feeling good about the place they work. The passion and the commitment people have in Alzheimer's society is enormous. And our job, my job as chief exec, is to make sure that we're allowing people to fulfil that potential and to make the biggest difference they can for people with dementia. Great. Um, so we're going to move on to our cactus questions. The Alzheimer's Society have had a lot of coverage in the press with Daily Express, uh, Daily, Daily Mail, um, which is quite right wing. Uh, some might say that right wing governments who presided over austerity are part of the problem with funding and issues in social care. Um, in terms of getting press support is it a case of just going for certain newspapers or um people who support certain sides of politics or just yeah. getting a message out to anyone who will sort of help spread what you're trying to do well i i think it's a matter of getting as many people as talking about it as we possibly can i mean i was very pleased that we could get the daily mail and the daily express willing to talk about dementia because as you say they tend to be the supporters of the status quo and fairly right of centre. And we thought we wouldn't get anywhere. So in the end, the Daily Mail decided to run a campaign to get more funding for dementia care. And we were very clear. We said, this is your campaign, not our campaign. So it was always us supporting them. 
and we we wanted to make sure that we weren't seen to be running a Daily Mail campaign because we've also worked with loads of other newspapers, with the BBC, hundreds of other organisations. But I really welcome the fact that you know if you're if you're honest about it, the Daily Mail is probably closer to the government than the Guardian. So if we want to have an influence on the government we've currently got, getting the Daily Mail to tell them dementia is an important issue is quite a valuable thing. Right. Um, and then, you know, thank you for those Chris, uh, Cactus questions. Very, really, really interesting. Um, so what's next for you? Um, I don't know, really. I'm going to sort of, I've got various irons in the fire. I'm looking for my next opportunity. What I decided was rather than stay, I've been here 10 years. Do you stay for another five year strategy or do you go somewhere else? And I thought, well, it's good to get somebody new coming in here and I'll look for something else I can do where I can contribute to the voluntary sector, to the movement. I've always worked in charities. I've always felt that I'm doing something I believe in. I hope somebody will want me to come and work for them for the next few years to continue that in another organization. But I'm also going to carry on being supporting Alzheimer's Society. I'm a member of the World Dementia Council and will continue in that. So I'm not turning my back on Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm saying it's a good time for somebody else to come in and take up the, the reins as the, as the chief exec of Alzheimer's Society. Great, and hopefully we might have um, that new CEO on uh, Co-Produce Care Chat in the future, potentially. That would be good, I'm sure she'd love to, yeah. Okay, so I think okay. that's it. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Jeremy, and good luck with all your future adventures. Um, Thank you. Thanks for being on our Co-Produce Care Chat. No, it's great to be here.